Hi, friends. So I wanted to share something with you that um, I saw on Ben Norton, the journalist, independent journalist Ben Norton's page. Um, and there was a, a survey done. It was by uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists in collaboration with UK-based research firm YouGov published a new study Monday detailing U.S. public opinion on military conflict with North Korea at a time when the pace of a historic peace process between the longtime rivals appears to be slow. This is from the article in Newsweek. And I'll just read you what Ben Norton said about this survey. Um, ben Norton, he said, this is a genocidal racism. This is the genocidal racism of imperialism. One third of the U.S. population would support, quote, preemptive, end quote, nuclear war on North Korea, even knowing it would kill one million innocent people. That's what they discovered in this uh, in this survey. It said, in this survey, when the number of expected North Korean deaths from the U.S. nuclear war, quote, increased from 15,000 to 1.1 million, preference for new using nuclear weapons among the respondents who favored the death penalty increased from 38% to 49%. This genocidal imperial racism is promoted by the U.S. government and corporate media. Some of the Americans surveyed said that they prefer nuclear war, quote, to end North Korea, end quote, because, quote, it's our best chance of eliminating the North Koreans, end quote. This is genocidal rhetoric. This is exactly why North Koreans see the U.S. as no better than Nazi Germany, except the Nazis lost World War II, whereas the U.S. killed 3 million Koreans in the Korean War, burning 80% of the cities in the north to the ground, and then continues to militarily occupy and terrorize the Korean Peninsula today. Uh, so that was a, a sort of a comment about that survey from Ben Norton. And you can take from that what you will about uh, some of the, uh, what imperialism and propagandizing the population does. And speaking about um, genocidal impulses, Donald Trump, I'll just quickly tell you what Donald Trump said last night uh, about North Korea because he didn't like a comment by the old Ayatollah Khomeini's, uh, he didn't like it. This is, this is the sort of response that, you know, the President of the United States gives to a, a comment by someone, another political leader that he doesn't like. Iran's very ignorant and insulting statement put out today only shows that they do not understand reality. Any attack by Iran on anything American will be met with great and overwhelming force. In some areas, overwhelming will mean obliteration. No more John Kerry and Obama. So that's the sort of uh, man-child which gives children a bad name uh, with an incredible ego. Uh, that's, that's what the U.S. has running them at the moment. And of course, you know, he's just a long line of different sort of psychopaths and um, you know this is he, he threatens obliteration of a country while yesterday saying that um, he didn't want to kill 150 Iranians which I knew was nonsense uh, when he that's why he backed off uh, he said it was a disproportionate response and yet now today the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, said something about you know that the there's a level of retardation within the US administration and this is his response to threaten genocide of a nation. Um, so this is the sort of, you know, th this indicates the sort of level of, um, you know, sort of insanity. I mean, Mr. Crazy Pants, it's, you know, uh, that, and, you know, sort of that's, that's why it, it only takes somebody saying something to him. And this sort of reminds me really of how the U.S. empire is in decline that they, they're constantly threatening. It's like, you know, for want of a better metaphor, like a wounded animal that's backed into a corner and is barking at every everyone, uh, just barking and barking because it sort of can see it, that it's, it, can't really, it can't really sustain. It can't really sort of keep on going, basically. And I think underneath all of this threatening, the empire knows it's in decline. It knows it's falling and it can see all its allies moving away from it because it's so insane, really, and moving together, coalescing together. So that's, that's um, you know, sort of how I sort of see it, this just constantly threatening. They know that, 
you know, the, the most dangerous point in an empire falling, of course, is now when, when, you know, this is, this is, it's going to get very, very dangerous and it is likely that he will attack Iran because, uh, because, well, why not? I mean, he, they don't care about carnage. They don't care about their own soldiers uh, being killed. They don't care about um, Iranians. They don't care about anybody, basically, being killed. They don't care about, they don't care about anybody being killed. I mean, why, why would they start now? They killed like two million North Koreans um, in, in, in 1953. You know, in you know, they, they killed a, you know, sort of a, a huge amount of the population and did unspeakable war crimes to them, the U.S. So, you know, why would they care? And, you know, they blew up um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, just innocent Japanese people, even though they didn't need to do that, that whole nonsense about that was what brought the end to the war. It was actually already coming to an end, and there was already moves by the Japanese to bring it to an end. And so that was just trying out their new weapons trying out what to see what nuclear weapons do to humans. Well, they found out it was horrific. Just bombing people. I mean, they so, you know, this is this is sort of and and they and the Pentagon just said recently that they think that they can win a nuclear war. I'm guessing they think with these limited nuclear weapons that they've produced. This is a sort of, you know, Dr. Strangelove thing we have going. And one more thing I want to say about that kind of behavior where it's just so impulsive. It's like a child over, like a child or um, overreacting to something and just impulsive behavior of Donald Trump. Um, they've always liked to pin this kind of behavior or they've always presented Latin American leaders as these sort of, you know, unstable and angry kind of characters. You know, you notice that probably. It's a sort of a racist sort of propaganda that they've kept putting out about um, Latin American leaders. Uh, one instance, even I saw just not that long ago, um, on The Good Wife, they had, um, Chavez, um, they didn't show his face, it just had this man in a red shirt, you could see them walking around, and he was sort of saying all these ridiculous things. And I just thought, wow, you know, you, the, uh, trope of these unstable, like, dictator types in Latin America, they just keep pumping it out there in the U.S. media, in the U.S. Hollywood keeps pumping it out there. Um, and the other, the last thing I want to talk about today uh, is very, very sad and sort of all I can say to this is tick, 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 sixth mass extinction. And that is um, in a colony of 40,000, just two penguin chicks survived uh, this year. And um, some, some of it was uh, attributed to, it says... Uh, the birds of, all, of a species known as the M-U-R-R-E, the Muir, uh, appear to have starved to death, federal wildlife officials say, suggesting disruptions to the food, to the supply of herring and other fish that make up the bird's diet. The survey by wildlife officials over the weekend counted more than 8,000 dead muirs on the shores of one beach near Whittier. See, this is, this is actually, another, there's a few instances of mass bird death and this is um, this isn't about the penguins, but something else. Eight thousand dead muirs on the shores of one beach near Whitt Whittier, about a hundred kilometers southeast of Anchorage, Alaska. Local news video showed bodies of the black and white birds scattered on the beach and floating in the water offshore. Wildlife officials say it's not yet known why the birds are starving. One possible explanation is that the birds' usual food supply, the schools of herring and other small fish usually found near the coast, have not material materialized this year, perhaps because of changing climate on or this year's extreme El Nino weather pattern. While generally plentiful everywhere in Alaska, herring populations have been depressed in the Prince William Sound since the 1983 Exxon Valdez oil spill. Um, the awful, there's also it's more the awful news that all the two peng, all but two penguin chicks have starved to death out of a colony of almost 40,000 birds in a grim il illustration of the enormous pressure Antarctic wildlife is under. The causes of the devastating event are complex from a changing climate to local sea ice factors, but one thing penguins, whales and other marine life don't need is additional strain on food supplies. Seabirds are starving to 
Death on the remote Lord Howe Island, a crew filming for the BBC One documentary Drowning in Plastic, has revealed their stomachs were so full of plastic there was no room for food. These birds are generalist predators, end quote, explain marine biologist Jennifer Lavers, who works with the Shearwater, Shearwater Colony. Quote, they'll, just, they'll eat just about anything they're given. That's what's allowed them to thrive, a lack of pickiness. Anyway, there's, um, you know, it, um, most of these birds had lots and lots of plastic in their stomach and then they were feeding plastic to their babies. In the Netherlands, on the, on the line with the coast, was a Coast Watch volunteer calling to tell him of reports of hundreds of dead guillemots washing up along the country's shores. Quote, the next morning my phone rang red hot from callers all over reporting dead birds, end quote. Leopold based in Wageningen University, Marine Research Department in the northern port of the of Den Helder, told AFP, quote, alarm bells started ringing. Since early January, more than 20,000 dead guillemots have washed up dead on Dutch beaches from the northern Wadden Islands to southwest Zealand. Quote, all the birds show signs of severe starvation and we do not know why, said Leopold. Um, so anyway, birds are starving all over the world. Um, one of the reasons which isn't mentioned here is probably because we're fishing the oceans out of uh, all aquatic life, um, particularly the animals that m mo the small little fish that uh, birds uh, feed on, um, the small little fish that large predators feed on. They're all being used not only by us, but also in they're being fed to fish and fish farms. They're being fed to chickens and cows and all sorts of things. A third, I think, of all the fish that are caught um, are actually fed to animal, um, animals in animal agriculture. I mean, that sounds crazy to be feeding fish to cows and stuff, but that's what they do. They just bulk up um, a lot of the food with feathers and uh, all sorts of things. I mean, there's been talk of euthanized animals are fed to cows and uh, you know, it's all about economic efficiency. You've probably heard about um, the terrible swine flu. Again, there's a, a huge swine flu that's going through industrialized farming, and that would be because of the, you know, millions and millions of tons of antibiotics that are fed to these animals every every year, and uh, that's to is a prophylactic measure. And of course, the bacteria then become resistant. And then so these virulent strains uh, actually then sort of wipe out populations of pigs, but they don't actually... So And then, then of course, the industry, the animal agriculture industry, then, of course, kills hundreds of millions like they're doing right now in awful, awful ways. Hundreds and mil um, hundreds, a couple of hundred million pigs have been, are going to be killed to stop the spread of this uh, swine flu. So, you know, feeding animals um, tons of, and tons of antibiotics uh, to prevent um, illnesses is just absolutely going to, it's going to, it, that's what is actually causing the post-antibiotic world that we are coming towards um, because um, it affects us too. And uh, pigs are very close to us. Um, and uh, so they, you know, it's, it, it can, it's something that we can actually pick up diseases, uh, some diseases, zoonotic diseases from pigs. Anyway, so that's one reason, of course. The other reason is, you know, they're so close together and that's they're, they're industrialized farms. And so they are all um, incredibly in close quarters and they're all under a lot of stress. And that's why they give them antibiotics. They also give them antibiotics. They give antibiotics to chickens to, and hormones to chickens to make them grow faster. Chickens grow so fast that their legs break. That's not uncommon. Chickens also grow so fast that they have heart attacks. That's not uncommon all these awful things and it's no better on the so-called free range free range is now is on massive scales uh, they pretend that um, it's free range if they have a little bit of room and they're in these huge warehouse sheds um, and they're still very stressed there's still diseased animals laying on the ground there's still dead animals laying on the ground they're really really stressed chickens are incredibly stressed they all start attacking one another it's a hellhole this is you know free range and barn laid and enrich cages and all that humane nonsense, you know, this so-called humane animal farming nonsense. So anyway, um, I'm getting off the track here, but the reason, one of the reasons a lot of these animals, which isn't being talked about, are having trouble getting uh, small fish is because, uh, you know, we are fishing the oceans out of fish. Just big trawlers taking, you know, just raking across the ocean floor, taking all kinds of animals, whether they're dolphins, whales, 
There's 130,000 dolphins killed just alone with, uh, with nets, fish nets floating around in the ocean. Uh, that's not to, that's not counting the amount of fish that are thrown overboard. Uh, every, for every five pounds of fish, four pounds are thrown overboard. And a lot of that are animals, fish, an, um, aquatic animals that we fetishize. I, I, I invite you to check out Seaspiracy. It's uh, got an, a, an account on Instagram. Check that out. C S E A S P I R A C Y. That's Nandi wearing his bird be safe collar. No, we don't like to dress up our cats. Um, so see Spiracy, check it out. It has horrendous information about what we're doing because we're not vegan when we are creating demand for these uh, aquatic animals and the devastation not only to, uh, to, to those animals but the devastation to the ocean and the effects on the climate crisis, etc. So, you know, you hear me talk about this oh, and you might think, oh no, here she goes again. I thought she was going to talk about something political and now she's talking about veganism again. Veganism at this point, it is, it's always been for me, uh, you know, the personal is the political. I cannot sort of talk about um, animals starving like birds starving without mentioning the fact that we are fishing the oceans out, basically. So, you know, it all comes back to veganism eventually. There's so many things that are connected now. You cannot talk about, in, unless you're being either ignorant or you're purposefully ignoring the, 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 the massive effect that animal agriculture has on the climate crisis, you can't really talk about the sixth mass extinction when the animal agriculture is directly um, causing the sixth mass extinction. And if you've seen those memes I show, and I'm going to show them again because I want everybody to see this largest study to date, this largest science study to date in the Journal of Science, 114 countries, um, 40,000 farms, 90% of all the foods we eat from farm to fork. And what was the conclusion they found? That um, eating a plant-based diet, eating a vegan diet was the, um, the, the, mo the, the single most important thing that anybody can do to address not only the climate crisis, but all um, the acidifications of the ocean and all sorts of things more than driving electric cars or any of that sort of thing it's the single most important thing that's that's what the largest study scientific study to date said so you know it is a at this point it's impossible I, I can't shut up about this issue uh, and I won't shut up about it because um, it's a tremendous violence to um, non-human animals whose only crime in quotes was to be born on this planet have the misfortune of being born on the same planet as our species which seems to love to exploit the vulnerable so um, there's you know that's that's the, the the reason that I'm vegan is because I reject exploiting the vulnerable I reject, uh, reject being a bully and I reject I, re I refuse to um, to see other animals on this planet as something other and that not worthy of our moral consideration. I reject speciesism, basically. So anyway, um, that's really all I wanted to say. I just think that's a tragedy. I usually, like I say, I, I try not to uh, look for awful news about the, the planet, uh, the environment, and uh, the animals that all the species that are suffering because of our anthropogenic climate disruption. But uh, I happened to see one today part posted by a friend of mine on social media and I just thought wow two chicks from 40,000 you know that's that's really really wild and really frightening and of course once again it makes me feel I feel my stomach turn in knots because I know that's just the tip of the iceberg that what's going on and it's like it's like um, death by a thousand awful awful um, instances it's just it's just one thing after another after another so, you know, we have, to, we have to do what we can, and that means we don't have to wait for governments and corporations to do things. We can actually do something right now and go vegan, and then we can do all the other things that we think are going to help bring these ridiculous people in government who seem to have an ecocidal bent, get them, and that means probably at some point we're going to have to do nonviolent civil disobedience and break the machine because there is no listening on their part. They're not interested. They don't need to be told what they need to do. They know what they need to do and they don't want to do it. So anyway, um, that's really all I wanted to say. Oh, you can see a little patty melon in the background there. He's coming up for something to eat. We give them little kangaroo pellets and carrots so they pop up and have a little nosh and then they go on their way because they're nocturnal. Um, and they live down in the forest down there. So I'll just show you.
that's the forest down there. That's where they come from. There's a few acres, and um, they tend to... Uh, there's a little colony of about 24 that live down there. Anyway, um, they bring their babies up in their pouches, and they're so sweet. <laughs> little tiny little tiny heads like that popping out of the pouches as mummy is eating. Anyway, so uh, that's all I wanted to say. I'm sorry. I'm sorry there is no real happy news to um, to talk about. I wish there were. I wish that every day it wasn't just something awful happening, whether it's some, you know, a child in the White House um, threatening to obliterate a country or, you know, there's some awful thing happening um, to do with the sixth mass extinction where, where we're on the front lines of. Uh, or, you know, something else. There's, you know, it's just always something. And, um, but, you know, uh, it's good to pay attention to some things and maybe we can change something. But something you can do right now is go vegan. So please check out howtogovegan.org. And thank you so much for watching. Please click the subscribe button if you like the content. Please click the notifications bell. Otherwise, you don't receive uh, the updates. And um, click the like button if you like the content. And always uh, feel free to leave comments. I always enjoy your comments. Um, I have no problem with people disagreeing with me as long as they're civil. Anyway, so thank you so much for watching. My name is Trish Roberts. You're watching Faint Signals from Vigo. Till next time. Bye for now.